small pieces of chips that is like the brain of all those electronic devices that we're using. Semiconductors and sustainability can be divided into two sides, the handprint and the footprint. How do you uh, see this kind of dilemma in technological advancement, also in energy transition? It goes a uh, uh, shu uh, lu se hua, puts them together for, uh, for a dual transformation. Everyone is interested in so many things, but not many people can, you know, manage time as good as you are. So those kinds of creative combinations let you do two things at once um, and have fun. Hi everyone, this is my eighth episode of Spark for Spark. I'm super excited that Erin is with us today. He's my fellow Yanqing scholar and we've known each other actually since last year's Yanqing Global Symposium. So Erin, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Awesome. Thank you very much, Dayu, and um, everyone. It's great to meet you. Um, I'm Aryan Ibrahimi. I'm currently an eighth cohort Yanqing scholar from the United States. Uh, I uh, previously worked in D.C. at the Semiconductor Industry Association, currently um, studying economics at Beida. Um, and after uh, finishing my studies at Yanqing, I'll be going to Georgetown University Law Center to start my JD. Your background is super diverse, like law, like semiconductor, like politics. So, oh my God, that is so impressive. I know that your area of interest is actually that small pieces of chips that is like the brain of all those electronic devices that we're using. It's penetrating into everywhere of our daily life, like computers, like even refrigerators. So yeah, how you get interested into semiconductors? Uh, certainly, I guess I could provide a bit of a, uh, a background on how I got into my last job and how I've continued my interest in chip policy um, since I've been here. Um, so it, it started during the pandemic. I was entering my uh, third year of undergrad, and uh, I had a different internship plan for the summer that got canceled due to COVID. And <laughs> I was trying to figure out, like, what am I going to do this summer of 2020? Um, and I, I realized I wanted to do something tech policy related, but which I could also do um, from my house, uh, my parents' home in Silicon Valley, where I was living. Uh, so I uh, applied to a few places, and I got an offer for an internship on the global policy team of the Semiconductor Industry Association, which is based in DC. Um, I, I, be, I began doing work there. This was um, during a very interesting time. Uh, it was the tail end of the Trump administration. There was a lot of trade policy going on, uh, in a ver very interesting time. And I started fi finding my work more fun than virtual classes. Uh, so I uh, finished undergrad a year early, moved to DC to work full time um, um, doing government affairs. Did a lot of work on law. That was a lot of fun. I learned a lot while I was there. Um, and then moving to China, I wanted to see how a very different society tries to answer the same industrial policy questions that I was working on in the U.S. and to get some context on that before going to law school. Um, and I've, uh, in that light, I started a, a newsletter on Substack called Chip Capitals, mm -hmm. where I've been writing about semiconductor policy by governments around the world. Um, been a lot of fun. Um, been diving especially deeply into China and China's semiconductor policy and comparing it with the U.S. Um, I've l I learned through my previous work that there are a lot of sustainability aspects related to chips as well, and I'm looking forward to talking about it all with you. Oh my God, I really enjoyed the way that you described your journey. So my question for you is really, like, I read your reports. We have been talking about the beer general trends like digitalization, like artificial intelligence, like IoT a lot, but we don't really mention chips. So could you introduce to others like uh, what is the importance of chips under those trends and how these are related? Yeah, so uh, I think um, chip policy and um, or semiconductors and sustainability can be divided into two sides, the handprint and the footprint. Um, the footprint is um, the uh, negative negative impact mm. that um, um, the production of semiconductors and the use of computing power have on the environment. Uh, so this includes the chemicals involved in the fabrication of chips. There are some rather toxic ones um, um, used in the process. Uh, the industry overall has um, relatively strong safety standards to prevent um, leakage, but many of these are controlled chemicals by um, the uh, environmental protection agencies of governments around the world. Um, and then the other side of it is um, data centers and general Generally, yeah. com computing generally is very energy intensive. Um, you may have heard of like the intense energy requirements of for Bitcoin mining. Yeah, so much so, so much so that these um, consuming lots of energy, electricity, absolutely. 
And so much so that these um, um, and Bitcoin mining centers have to be like placed in uh, cheap energy environments um, in often rural areas um, yeah. to make it economical to do so. Um, uh, so uh, that's a major concern. And as society gets more and more digitized, um, there's increasing concern about the actual energy suck of um, compute. Um, but in some ways, the bigger story is the handprint um, of um, um, computing power, digitization, semiconductors um, in empowering. Um, um, Internet of Things um, so, um, solutions to digitize uh, a range of um, existing industries um, to increase um, the energy efficiency of the energy grid, even uh, re reduce the need to commute to work uh, by being able to go online and have meetings. So there, uh, there's both uh, a footprint that um, needs to be reduced in semiconductors and energy usage, um, as well as a, a handprint that, sh that people want to expand oh. in increasing how digitization can increase energy efficiency in other um, in other contexts. Ah, so really, technology is like a double-edged sword. So you should maximize its positive impact while minimize its negative impacts. So I also read through the articles you provided me yesterday. There is a very impressive number saying that digital technology will contribute to 20% of carbon emissions reduction in the next 10 years. However, uh, as you've just mentioned, the footprint of chips of digitalization it is also very energy consuming. So how do you uh, see this kind of dilemma mm -hmm. in technological advancement, also in energy transition? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I, I won't cite ex um, exact numbers here. The next Chip Capitals report that we have will include all the oh, exact well, stats. Please on... subscribe to it. <laughs> yes, yes. Please do. Please do. Um, so, so in that next article, I'll be providing exact stats on um, uh, what uh, what directions energy use and energy savings have been going um, with regard to complete power. Um, but um, to, to put it in context a little bit, in terms of the footprint, data centers have um, increased their, their overall um, data processed um, uh, exponentially over the past um, 10 years, but their energy usage has remained um, consistent, which means they've become more efficient, mm -hmm. less um, energy required um, per data of compute. Please wait for the next Chip Capital's article to verify <laughs> any stats that I say here. At another end of it, the increased um, pervasiveness of the, of the cloud has increased efficiency because uh, when data was uh, stored mostly on local devices, on mobile phones or computers, it was um, in a less efficient environment than when it was stored, when as now it's being stored in large centralized data centers. Mm -hmm. For example, your uh, uh, iPhone photos are uploaded to the iCloud on Apple servers. It's um, less energy intensive to have them there than on your phone. Um, and if you multiply that impact by um, uh, billions of people's phones, with pictures on them that ends up being a significant impact. Yeah. I, I do want to uh, note though that Compute process power accounts for um, just about 1% mm -hmm. of global carbon emissions, uh, which means the real impact of um, semiconductors and computing on um, global climate change is not so much, it's actually not as much in the footprint okay. as on the handprint in digitization um, advancements that it, uh, in existing industries that improves mm -hmm. down the road. And I'm happy to talk more about that. Yeah, that's positive news. But I have to say, this is a very broad topic. Like, there are so many complex things, complex components involved in this whole general, like, statement. So that I wonder, um, what are the areas you're going to focus on later? Also, you mentioned you want to talk a, a little bit more about... Yeah, the, the handprint. Yeah, the handprint side. My uh, um, interest in semiconductor policy they extend beyond uh, sustainability to uh, general general industrial policy on how governments both increase semiconductor uh, manufacturing capacity mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, uh, support research in, in the cutting edge of semiconductors. Um, but in the context of sustainability, it's very interesting um, seeing how uh, um, uh, semiconductor energy policy is a subset of larger. Um, um, semiconductor industrial mm. policy. Um, in, in many cases, so over the past like five-ish years, governments around the world have been passing I enormous subsidies uh, for their semiconductor industries, uh, not just focused on sustainability, but just uh, increasing supply chain security. This is part of um, growing um, tech tensions and global decoupling narratives, uh, things like that. But uh, unbeknownst to many people, um, uh, governmental energy agencies have been funding microelectronics research for quite 
quite a while now. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, in the U.S., the Department of Energy's um, Office of Science um, has funded microelectronics pol- um, uh, research for application in um, data centers, yes, also in um, uh, electric vehicles, um, in energy grids. Um, um, uh, the European um, energy agencies have been very active in this, uh, and China uh, just over the past, since 2019, has made it a priority to increase the energy efficiency of data centers. And more recently, in 2022, it passed a plan to increase the uh, um, sustain uh, to to use digitization to um, uh, support the greenification of the economy. It, it goes a chose hua for lu se hua puts them together um, uh, for uh, for a dual transformation. Um, and I think that's very exciting. I feel like we would talk a lot about the technology things, the politic things. These are all very much interesting. And I really wish to know more about you, like at a personal level. Sure. So actually, I should say that, Erin, you're very impressive because last year I actually met you at the Yanqing Global Symposium. <laughs> and at that time, you stand out among the 200-ish delegates. You have been very actively involved in all those panel discussions and the questions and answers and also in uh, presenting yourself. How did you gain this kind of magic to like <laughs> sell your ideas yourself to everyone. This is fantastic. Well, well I, 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 I told Jayu at the beginning here that uh, if she complimented me, I would return the compliment by saying <laughs> I, f- I first met her at uh, YGS last year as well and thought uh, she was so awesome and, I, and I'm so happy that you're back from New York. I get curious um, about a lot of different um, uh, policy areas and what I've found is uh, I, I, I try to have more than one tool in my tool set. Oh. Um, I, I want, I've wanted to be a lawyer uh, for a while, and I'm very excited to be going to law school in the U.S. after uh, my studies at Beida. Um, I got very interested in a particular industry um, through my own work in D.C. Um, in government affairs, um, uh, the industry being semiconductors, obviously. Um, and I got interested in a region, China, also through my work um, in D.C. Um, and it's, I, it, my interest in that has grown even more since I've been here. Um, so I, I've been, I'm hoping to have a career where I can combine these tools of um, industries um, that I know well, um, regions that I find very interesting, and um, uh, uh, legal skills that provide a bit of a sharper um, tool. So I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California. Um, I'd hope to end up back there. Um, And I'm really excited about a job where I can be based in Northern California, but be going back and forth between Washington and Beijing, um, kind of using California as like a bridge um, um, between the two countries. That's my general approach to things. Oh, I love it. Especially, I love everything has a root in your past experiences. This is so good. And then also you mentioned that you're interested in so many things. So the final question is really is time management, right? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is interested in so many things, but not many people can you know, manage time as good as you are. So you told me that you like to combine different things into one time slot so that you can maximize the time efficiency. <laughs> so you can introduce more on that. Uh, sure, sure. I, I think, uh, oh, one, you can, you can spend more time doing the productive things that are useful for you if they're things that you also enjoy. Um, like, I enjoy learning Chinese. Um, I enjoy researching semiconductors. Uh, and so I'm willing to spend more of my personal time mm-hmm. doing those things. Well, one way I combine the two that I uh, find very productive is, for example, with Chip Capitals. Every other week, I do a, a little bit more low-key um, uh, article analyzing a piece of um, uh, uh, Chinese media talking about semiconductors. Mm-hmm. Um, it, usually, that would be a, um, a, an article from the People's Daily or from Xinhua. Um, and what I do is I, uh, I very slowly, painstakingly, and with a lot of reliance on Baidu uh, as a dictionary, um, <laughs> And translate um, an article from uh, Renmin Zhibao uh, to English. Uh, so I get both um, Chinese language practice out of that, as well as writing an article uh, for, for the newsletter. So those kinds of creative combinations let you do two things at once um, and have fun while you're doing it. Oh, I love it. This is a very important suggestion, I think, to every one of us, right? And then let's come to the last session. Sure. I'm gonna collect your spark. My spark? Collect my yeah, spark. Yeah, your spark. So, like your general advice for to other young people, to the world, or so probably to yourself. Mm-hmm. So, could you hold this phone for me? I'm gonna take out my spark jar. Spark jar? Yeah. Whoa. 
Yeah, so this is the spark jar. I give you a piece of paper. Okay. And you can write down your spark. Okay. Literally, I just help Arian <laughs> with the star, you know. Got a star. Yeah. And then I'm gonna ask Arian to put his star into my jar. Put in the star? Yeah. In the jar. Thanks, Arian. This is my eighth spark. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Jayu. I enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, then see you. See you later. Bye. Bye. Nice meeting you all. Oh, yeah. Chinese is good. Chinese is good.